All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for attending this afternoon's Star Justice webinar, Post-Pandemic Realities in Small, Tribal, and Rural Jails. Before I introduce our topic and our panelists, I want to introduce ourselves, myself and our center. I am Kenitra Brown, Staff Attorney and Director of Engagement for the Decent Criminal Justice Reform Center and the moderator for today's program. The Decent Center is a nonpartisan policy, research, and advocacy center housed at SMU Denton School of Law. We use a stats and stories approach to smart, sane, and sensible criminal legal reform. The crux of our expertise is in the Sixth Amendment with a focus on the right and access to counsel. And our major research areas focus on pretrial due process and early stage criminal procedure. Star Justice, our small tribal and rural criminal justice systems and connections programs, and prosecutorial discretion with a specific focus on screening and charging processes. For our returning audience and those of you who may be new to the Decent Center Star Justice series, the events in these series highlight innovations, challenges and opportunities in small tribal and rural criminal legal systems. Drawing on the experiences and expertise of people who live and work in STAR communities, this series also offers a networking platform for STAR practitioners, stakeholders, researchers, and policymakers nationwide. Um, our esteemed panelists today are Jasmine Heiss, of the Vera Institute of Justice, and she's the project director of In Our Backyards, an initiative exploring the shifting geography of mass incarceration and elevating the surprising truth that America's highest rates of incarceration are not in the biggest cities, but in the nation's hundreds of smaller cities, towns, and rural areas. Her work is meant to inform public dialogue, engage new allies, and advance change in order to end mass incarceration where it begins, in our backyards. Sheriff Eric Higgins, has been a sheriff of Pulaski County, Arkansas since 2019, and has over 30 years experience as a law enforcement officer, including a 30 year career in the Little Rock Police Department, and the last 10 years of which he was the assistant chief of police. He is heavily involved in community and public service, including as an instructor, volunteer coordinator, school volunteer, and board member of several civic organizations. As part of his working philosophy and shares platform, he is committed to working to bring the Pulaski County community and local law enforcement closer together and building a model of just policing. He believes that creating a positive and productive relationship between the two will improve the quality of life and safety for the residents of Pulaski County. He believes in always working with integrity and employing a crime prevention approach, not an arrest a driven approach. His end goal as Pulaski County Sheriff is a lack of crime throughout the community and not a high prison count. <clears throat> Professor Aaron Lippman joins us from UCLA School of Law. He's a former Binder Clinical Teaching Fellow at UCLA Law and will move up as an assistant professor of law starting this fall. His clinical teaching focuses on litigation and policy advocacy, challenging actions of police and prison and jail officials. Most recently, he's developed and led a year-long appellate prisoner's rights camp clinic in which students briefed and argued the civil rights cases of formerly incarcerated, a formerly pro se incarcerated plaintiffs in, federal, in the federal court of appeals. Since early 2000, he's been the deputy director of the COVID Behind Bars Data Project, supervising the collection and analysis of pandemic data from carceral facilities across the country. <clears throat> and serving as an expert commentator for various media outlets across the nation. His scholarship, which can be found on SSRN or his public faculty bio via UCLA law, focuses on, sub -constitutional, on the subconstitutional law of incarceration. His most recent article published in Vanderbilt Law Review explores the roles that sheriffs and other county officials play in determining the supply of and demand for jail bed space and assesses the fiscal and financial incentives for expansion. Sheriff Ray Seifries has been the Sheriff of Hockley County, Texas since 2017 as a former DA investigator for the Yoakum County Criminal District Attorney's Office. He also currently serves as the adjunct instructor of law enforcement at various institutions, a director of the Sheriff's Association of Texas, and is a committee member on several criminal justice advisory committees, and a member and former member of the Texas Jail Association. He received his Bachelor of Applied Arts and Sciences and Master of Science from Lamar University and is currently pursuing a doctorate of management from Wayland Baptist University. 
He's a vocal advocate for systems approaches to jail administration to make our criminal legal system more effective and efficient to help reduce recidivism and to increase public safety. Before we start our discussion, I want to give you a bit of background on our topic today and to reiterate that as your moderator, I'm here to primarily guide the discussion, but I want you to hear mostly from my panelists. So think of this webinar as a conversation with opportunities for insights and questions from those of you in the audience. Feel free to drop your questions or comments in the Q&A box or in the chat, but please be respectful and we'll be sure to let our panelists know if they miss anything uh, about your questions or comments in those places. A little background on our topic before we begin or about what we're talking about today. Um, and I'll allow our panelists to get into this a little bit more. But it's important to note that during the pandemic, some county jails dropped their carceration, the carceral rates by more than 50%. But overall, by 2021, and this will probably be discussed at some point by our representative from Vera Institute, the Vera Institute of Justice reports that jail populations have increased 13% from the mid 2020s low just by last spring. And those numbers continue to get higher. So I think for today, we'll be discussing the mechanisms and levers that can be used or pulled to address jail administration and pretrial detention rates in the larger conversation around public safety and especially those rising to detention rates post pandemic. And so for everyone on the panel, and we'll start with Erin, could you tell us about your current projects, positions of scholarship or experience that shape your understanding of this issue? Of this issue? We'll start with Erin. Thanks so much um, to Kenitra and the Decent, uh, Decent Center. And I'm so delighted to be here um, with um, such insightful panelists uh, and, and really eager to, to learn from you all. Um, my background is in uh, prison and jail conditions advocacy and uh, since coming to UCLA, my research has focused in large part on um, jails, on uh, the officials who run them and manage them, and uh, on understanding the authority that they have to make uh, reform in this space. Um, so that's uh, where my legal scholarship focuses. Um, I've also uh, helped to run a project that I didn't expect to exist, but uh, tracking COVID in uh, prisons and in some jails that, that report data um, about about COVID as well. So I'll, I'll mention that uh, more later on. Jasmine? Great, thank you so much. And uh, to echo Aaron, delighted to be here today and to be joined by very smart people. Um, as you said, Kenitra, I lead the In Our Backyards Initiative at the Vera Institute of Justice, where I have the privilege of directing work that is specifically focused on responding to the rise of incarceration in both smaller cities and rural communities across the country. Um, on a personal level, I grew up in rural Michigan. I have family who are both have been to jail and prison and have worked in the justice system. So this is both a personal and a professional commitment for me. In my professional capacity, my work looks like working with community members, civil society, and government at the state, local, and federal level to think both about the policies and contexts that bring people into jail and also about funding and resources that can create different responses and alternative responses, ideally, in the systems that we all rely on for safety and for justice. Thanks so much. Sure, Higgins. One second, we're gonna unmute you, just a moment. Sorry. Apologize for that. Um, my focus at the, at the Pulaski County Sheriff's Office is we're looking at, at the recidivism rate in, in our facility at a county level and trying to uh, address that to uh, prevent the people from returning to our facility. Uh, we think that if we can address that at, at a local level, then we'll have a, uh, an impact at a state level on on recidivism uh, instead of waiting for someone to uh, spend three or four or more years in a state prison. And if we can uh, address that at the local level, uh, then we can uh, reduce the recidivism at, at the local level, also reducing crime at the local level uh, because people are coming in uh, into a detention facility, into a county jail, uh, probably 
the people, 80% of the people, 85% uh, of people who are booked into a county jail will be released into the community uh, prior to uh, spending any time in the state facility. So we're focusing on, on that area. And uh, I get my experience from that from after I retired from Little Rock Police Department, working with uh, a reentry program uh, dealing with people coming out of state prisons uh, and trying to uh, restore them to the community, give them tools they needed prior to their release uh, and seeing the success rate, the reduction in recidivism at that level. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do at, at the sheriff's office here. And Sheriff Seifert. Thank you all again very much for, for letting me uh, to, to play along with you all today. This is the first one of these I've ever gotten to do, so I'm, I'm excited to be here and with the panelists that are here. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, you know, at, at much like uh, Sheriff Higgins said, you know, at the local level, uh, is where you really see uh, these issues and you feel them the most. Uh, so addressing um, recidivism and you're seeing some of the same faces over and over again, uh, and how do we break that cycle? Um, even pre-COVID, uh, and particularly during COVID, we, we were uh, experiencing um, issues in the jail like everybody else was. Uh, populations uh, were in some part dictated by how the local system was operating. So I really, uh, even when I came into office, really wanted to look at a systems approach and how can we bring all the stakeholders together uh, to address these problems. And I think COVID um, really exacerbated some of the issues we were seeing, and, but it also sped up some of the processes we were already working on and some things we were trying to do uh, to get out in front of any potential problems. So that transition was a little bit easier, I think, for some of us on our on our side because we had already started those conversations. So um, related to the, the, the broad topic, really we want to uh, look at local approaches because um, really truly what, what will work in Little Rock, Arkansas may not work in Leveland, Texas. Um, and it may not work in Dallas or in some of the other areas. We're looking for local solutions, local systems, and how can we address these problems uh, the best way? Um, but engaging um, places like the, the Dedman School, and like the Decent Center, and getting into panels like this, and, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm all about begging, borrowing, stealing ideas. So if you see me institute one and you thought of it first, I'll give you credit, but we may put it into play. So we are looking for local solutions, but definitely open to the broader conversation to see what the real story is uh, at, at the regional, state, and national levels. And this is why I love you, Sheriff Sykes, because your last statement dovetails us perfectly into our next part of the discussion. Um, and as he said, yes, these types of conversations we use so that it can inform the practitioners, stakeholders, and all on these calls. Um, we think star communities have a lot to say to urban areas and vice versa. So the uniqueness of these of these areas of these communities allow those innovations to have something to say to each other. So moving forward, I want to start with Aaron and then you guys can feel free to jump in as necessary to kind of talk us through um, what we're talking about. We're talking about carceral conditions and jails um, and what we were talking about as far as pre-shot attention rates and concerns uh, pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, um, and then what we're looking at now, or why, we're, why we ought to be concerned about these conversations. Sure, well, I'll, I'll start kind of briefly and just give a, what I think of as a sort of framing thought and then um, eager to hear from Jasmine, who's uh, the expert on all the moving pieces and, and from the two sheriffs on um, their own firsthand experiences of, of the challenges of their jobs, which are really, um, enormous and and I just want to acknowledge that at the outset and so um you know there are a, a wide range as I suspect all of the practitioners on this call know of um conditions challenges in jails across the country but at a broad level I think a, a primary problem is that jails are being asked or really forced to serve a public health function for which they're fundamentally ill-suited um so I'll give a few examples on one hand um jails have increasingly had to grapple with the needs of people with mental illness and substance use disorders. Um, and that is largely because community-based care and treatment services have been defunded. And that's that's especially acute in rural areas. And, and this has been true for some time. It's, it's um, getting to be even more of a serious problem as, as time goes on, but it's, it's long been true. More recently, um, jails have been forced to confront the particular challenges of trying to keep people healthy from a contagious and frequently mutating respiratory virus. Um, 
And uh, jails are not good places to do either of these things, right? Providing mental health care in jails is inherently more difficult and more costly and less effective than doing so in the community. And jails, despite their very best efforts, um, simply can't avoid the spread of infectious disease. Uh, housing people together is not a place where you can do that. Um, you can you can make efforts. You can uh, you can um, you can try to protect people as best you can, but it's it's never going to be a good place to do that. Um, so, in my view, one primary lesson to draw from from looking at jail conditions during the pandemic is that we need to focus our resources on providing real public health responses rather than um, carceral responses wherever possible. And to do that, we need to keep jail populations as small as possible so that we can invest in other sites of community caretaking. And um, this has a real added virtue of, of lifting um, some of, not all of, but some of the unreasonable burdens that we currently place on jail administrators and jail staff and, and making it more possible for them um, to do their job safely and humanely. So that's, that's how I sort of think about the universe of um, jail conditions, problems that have existed for a long time and um, have been really brought into, um, into focus by the pandemic. So I'll, I'll stop there for now um, and hand it over to, uh, to the others. Aaron, I'm gonna pick up on, on something you said and frame it in a slightly different way, which is borrowed from a county judge executive from Eastern Kentucky. Um, from Madison County. And, and what he always says to me is, look, we're paying for our jail, but we're just the catcher's mitt. The county is the catcher's mitt and the jail is the catcher's mitt for all of the systems, policies, practices, and decision makers that surround it. Um, I think there's a slight caveat to that, and I will give a hat tip to your work to sort of illuminate the varying degrees of statutory authority that sheriffs and jailers and wardens have to make release or detention decisions. But, you know, I think overwhelmingly the point holds that what happens in our nation's jails reflects everything that surrounds those jails. And so you can't really talk about conditions, particularly where conditions are fueled by overcrowding or the number of people in jail without talking about the policy decisions that are implicated in, in who goes to jail and how long they stay. So everything from, you know, what kinds of arrests are being made, where are citations or summonses being used, where is sort of pre-arrest diversion being used to what a pretrial justice system looks like, how frequently unaffordable money bond is being set, what people are being remanded for, all the way through to how long people sit in jail, um, how quickly their cases are processed, whether or not there is meaningful speedy trial law in the state or what that looks like locally. And then of course, the huge intersection of supervision and the way in which violations of probation and parole bring people back into local jails many times. And, and so I think it's important as we talk about conditions and as we talk about the trajectory during COVID-19 of jail populations to sort of think about at a very macro level what we learned. Um, what we saw in sort of the initial response to the spread of COVID behind bars was a really significant decline in three primary kinds of bookings. And these are very broad categories, but we saw court driving and drug related offenses, bookings into jail significantly drop. And, you know, in many ways and in many places, that was a bigger determinant of jail population changes than releases, for example, because we're talking about, you know, as Sheriff Higgins said, a, a place where there's churn already. State prisons are sort of governed by people being released early when they come out. There is a real power in shaping jail populations and deciding that some people were not going to cross the threshold. Um, so I think that's a, that's a sort of lesson, it's a conditions lesson and it's a jail population lesson to take away from this. The specific implications, I think, particularly for resource poor communities is how do we make sure, you know, as Aaron said, there is the infrastructure to respond to and support people who then weren't going into jail. And I think that there are opportunities to be sort of grabbed from what we learned during the pandemic. And there's also really underscoring what resources didn't exist and we needed to build and weren't in place. And so for things like drug related offenses, you know, when we talk to sheriffs, law enforcement, judges, others about pretrial diversion, for example, they will say diversion to what? 
And I think the related question is how do we build meaningful infrastructure so that that is a reality, that's a real thing that people can access. Um, when we talk about saying, okay, we're going to not book people into jail for failure to appear in court, for example, because we know that so often that's because people forgot or the form wasn't clear or they had a lack of transportation or childcare issue. How do we treat that also as something that a system can respond to instead of just saying it's entirely at the feet of individuals? And so I think, you know, it's really a challenge to reimagine how systems do a lot of things and it's also um, implicates resources. The last thing I'll say before I stop talking and, and hand it to the people who, again, are really on the front lines of this work is that the other thing we saw that very much implicates conditions during COVID that I think is part of a longer standing issue is, of course, this jurisdictional shift. So courts shut down, things sort of ground to a halt. And in some places, we saw a swelling of jail populations as people just were sitting and waiting for their day in court or were post disposition but hadn't been transferred um, from jails to state prisons and you know, created even more unsafe conditions, both for staff and for the people who were living temporarily in those facilities. Uh, one of the data points that always stands out to me is between, I think 2019 and spring 2021, West Virginia's prison population declined 43% but the jail population increased 18%. And so half of those declines were completely erased because it was just people sitting in jails waiting to be transferred. That I think is connected to this larger shift that we've seen over the past several decades where you know new prisons by and large are not being built, but more and more frequently jails are absorbing the population of people that used to go to state prison or would have otherwise gone to state prison. And there hasn't necessarily been a concurrent effort to say, how do we understand how people who were already filling jails, places that were already overcrowded, we think differently about who's going inside and why and how long they're staying. So I'll, I'll stop there. There's a lot to say, but um, I would love if, if one of the two sheriffs on the call wanted to jump in on this issue. I'll jump. I'll volunteer. <laughs> so. Um... At our, at our local level, when you talk about um, what was going on, say, pre-COVID and then during when the pandemic began, um, you know, for us, we had went from a year uh, of making about a thousand arrests in our county. I mean, we have a population of about twenty two and a half thousand um, that seemed to fluctuate a little bit. But uh, for a 64 bed jail, that's a fair number of bookings. And um, we saw immediate reductions in uh, the early part of 2020. And for that total year, we were down 300 or so arrests that year. And then we started really looking, when we started seeing reductions, what were those arrests really for? Um, what are we not seeing coming into the jail now? Uh, and by and large, there, as, as Jasmine mentioned, you know, you have some of these, what we would call like a technical violation. Maybe it was a driving without a valid license, uh, something it can be cited and released for. Um, class C, or, you know, in Texas, we have those class C misdemeanors, those fine only offenses um, that can be arrested for. Um, uh, but we were seeing a reduction in those. So uh, that definitely helped our population. We were finding also on the other side of this, the ones who are here are staying longer. And there are some reasons for that, obviously, uh, that have been touched on. The slowdown of the system of justice locally, when the courts in Texas closed, uh, like they did in so many other parts of the, of the country, we were having to adapt and the courts were having to adapt. We still have ongoing criminality. We still have... Um, individuals who are gonna be detained are gonna be arrested. So what is the process to get these taken care of uh, in a timely fashion so that we can still maintain and preserve the rights of the, of the accused? Um, we had to, to make adapt, uh, adaptations there. Luckily in our system, uh, we had already started those conversations and going to Zoom when it was a thing, uh, we were already talking that and going that direction. This just kind of sped it along and we were learning as we went. Um, but it definitely was a, a benefit for us and helped with some of those slowdowns. The other thing that really uh, impacted our jail populations uh, were the convicted offenders who were being housed locally because we, because we could not transfer them to the prison systems. They stopped accepting inmates. Uh, and that does put a strain on the local uh, resources. And as Professor Littman mentioned uh, about the mental health side of it and jails, you know, how um, equipped are we to handle these situations? 
uh, when we're seeing more offenders with substance use disorder or with a co-occurring mental, uh, mental illness, serious mental illness, um, or something that may be drug-induced at the time they're booked, um, we are asking our jail staff to take on so many more responsibilities. Um, and, and almost in a way, and, I, and when I give a lecture sometimes at some of the conferences, I've mentioned this uh, about, we are basically asking them to be mind readers and clairvoyants. What is this person thinking when they come in the jail? Um, and what are they gonna do going forward? So how are we gonna get out in front of this? We are asking them to do a whole lot that, and let's be honest, they are not mental health clinicians. They are not practitioners. Uh, these folks are criminal justice professionals. They are detention professionals. And they're here, we are in the security business. Um, but we are expanding those roles so much. And what strain does it put on our staff? So that was another consideration that we have is uh, not just the offender population, but look at the staffing and look at um, how can we maintain a healthy staff? I agree with the sheriff is, you know, part of the problems we ran into, we run into is when the states shut down and because of COVID, they said, we're not going to receive anyone. But yet we still have the responsibility uh, when people are arrested to uh, house them in, in our facility. And Pulaski County Sheriff's Office, we're a regional detention facility. We have uh, seven other uh, law enforcement agencies that are um, bringing people to our facility. And uh, prior to COVID, we were uh, running about, it's a 1,210 bed facility, but we were running uh, about uh, 1,230 was our average daily population. Uh, with over 200 um, waiting to go to state uh, facility. Uh, during COVID, uh, we saw our population go down to a record low of, of about 700 uh, after uh, about six months into uh, 20. Um, and, and we had uh, worked with the courts and we worked previously with the courts and the prosecutor's office to be able to release some uh, nonviolent offenders when they're booked in, we would cite them out. Um, uh, and we weren't holding any uh, misdemeanor offenses. Uh, um, but then by November of 20, uh, our population started going back up. We're, we're averaging a thousand. And, and now we're averaging uh, uh, 1,260 average. Today we have 1,290 in the facility. Uh, mental health is is a major issue, um, and, and you're right. It's been said that that uh, we're the fallback for people with mental health issues. Um, we're holding people for evaluations. We're, you know, we know that some of the people are, are accused of crime, or or uh, their issue may have led to uh, them being arrested for other things. But their core issue is is they need some assistance with with their mental health issues or their drug issues, and we're being forced to hold these individuals. Uh, people call, family members call and say they don't need to be in a jail, they need to be in a uh, in another facility, uh, but there's no facility for them to go to. And, and so that burden uh, comes on us. Uh, prior to COVID, like the sheriff said, we were looking at, uh, uh, the state was going to what's called Justice Bridge, so you can do uh, first appearance uh, through video. And we got pushback from all the courts. Most courts didn't want to do it. Uh, during COVID, the, the fear of, of the pandemic caused them to embrace um, the technology. But as we're moving away from it, uh, they uh, most courts are pushing away from it. And so we're transporting just as many people uh, to court uh, for just an appearance. Uh, you know, and, and we try to work with the courts with our population so high. Uh, we try to work with the courts. We contact them weekly, uh, give them a list of people that are, are in their court. Is there anyone that they can release? Anyone that they can reduce bond on? Um, and we don't get the uh, the response that we would like uh, to to reduce the population. Um, and, and it's a you know you run into staffing issues. What was mentioned about uh, you're concerned about people's health. A detention facility is not the ideal place for uh, people who are, who are being housed there. It's also not the ideal place for people who are working. And so that's impacted uh, uh, staffing levels of people who actually want to work in an attention environment. Now, we're blessed that we, we do have a medical uh, provider in the facility, uh, but they're struggling to maintain their staffing because, again, we're in a detention uh, facility and, and people are reluctant to be in, in a uh, closed environment like this. Uh, 
Um, so it's, it's, it's impacted us. To, uh, and we hope to see some uh, real changes uh, coming out of the pandemic. Uh, but uh, people are getting more, the courts are more comfortable. And, um, you know, we saw our daily population, uh, the, the time people were in jail went from maybe averaging 15 days to, to now we're averaging uh, around 35 uh, days uh, in the facility. And so that is just uh, creating a extreme burden on the uh, local uh, jails. Before we move into kind of the barriers to those systems approaches and responses to this, uh, one of the things that we've, we've got a question about it and I wanted to ask is what are, are, are um, and to follow up on the discussions around which types of offenses were not booked into jail. I was wondering if you guys could be, if anyone, uh, the sheriffs especially, but if anyone could be more specific about the types of uh, offenses that either weren't booked in um, or they were booked in and cited out, or, um, and he didn't mention this, but Sheriff Higgins um, and Pulaski County prosecutors had a list of offenses, felony, uh, felony level offenses that were, that had a booked in status that they could release on without having to wait for a bond appearance or bail hearing. If you guys could talk on like what some of those specific offenses and charges were. Um, and even, I guess, in this part of the discussion, um, talk about why, um, or any pushback that they may have had about public safety concerns around those types of charges uh, would be great before we move to the barriers. Well, the, the agreement, like you mentioned, the agreement we had and is uh, extended uh, prior to my time uh, with the prosecutor's office, uh, nonviolent offenses, uh, people were, were releasing it's a felony record. If it was a felony charge for theft, uh, we were we were going to release them. If it was a, a failure to appear, uh, we were going to uh, we release them. We cite them out, give them a, another a court date. Uh, now, all honesty, the reason that the agreement was made initially, it wasn't about uh, fair treatment of, of people being booked into a facility or anything. It was about um, uh, bed space and the sheer number of people. Uh, being arrested, and so was to to relieve the burden, so that we could house more serious offenders. Uh, the only misdemeanor that we will hold in our facility, uh, if it's a domestic, if someone charged with a domestic uh, um, charge, we will hold them uh, till their first appearance. The only other misdemeanors we will hold is if uh, a person is convicted and they're sentenced into our facility. Uh, then we will house them uh, for a period of time. But uh, the, the drug charges, we're, we're holding uh, those individuals. Uh, a lot of our, our people in the facility uh, are facing uh, drug charges. And then you know you have uh, felony drugs, I mean, federal drug charges. Uh, you know, when you put all the task force together and, and you target um, the, the drug sellers, a lot of uh, those people were end up caught in that net. Or their real issue is their addiction, and and so they're they're really a, uh, people suffering from addiction who are get caught in the in that net, and then they're uh, sitting in this facility um, for a year, uh, uh, maybe a year and a half before they actually go to go to trial on these federal charges. Um, I'll just jump in and say I think that the question about who determined it is a question that illuminates the fact that we don't have one justice system in the country. We have 3,000 plus uh, for every county and then on top of that many, many more police departments. And so what we saw really was a very different response depending on where people were, depending on where leaders um, in different facets of the justice system wanted to take those local systems and then I will say what sort of leadership or role the state Supreme Courts took on these issues. Um, so for example, in some police departments, there were clear directives and sheriff's departments not to make arrests for certain kinds of charges, often things like driving on a suspended license or um, loitering low level public order offenses that wouldn't, you know, otherwise have, that would have put officers and the accused into sort of unnecessary contact and 
risked their health. We also saw, you know, in some places, Tennessee, for example, a, a call or a push, the same happened in Pennsylvania from state Supreme Courts for each county or jurisdiction, sort of how the courts break down to put together a plan for responding to COVID within sort of broad parameters of keeping people safe and reducing unnecessary bookings into jail or unnecessary contact with law enforcement. So out of that, we saw, for example, um, the temporary elimination of money bond for misdemeanors and or low level felonies, usually non person. So non sexual nonviolent crimes, depending on how those are categorized in a particular state. Um, you know, in some places we saw, for example, both the courts and the jail say together were not concerned because we think there's adequate space for social distancing. And then in other places, so, you know, California and Kentucky, two very different states, um, there was clear guidance issued and, and sort of mandatory or uniform approaches that spanned urban to rural across all of the counties. And so in Kentucky, for example, you saw the expansion of a sort of pre-COVID rule that had applied to misdemeanors, applied to low-level felony offenses, um, where if a person had been assessed as, you know, quote unquote, low to moderate risk, which of course is fraught, but we can talk about that, um, by pretrial services, they could, be they could be released by a pretrial services officer to come to their court dates later, as opposed to sitting in jail until they could be seen by a judge. Um, we saw things like statewide bail schedules, for example, which, you know, again, fraught, but were in place during the Constitution or during the, the COVID pandemic. And I think the other thing that we've sort of seen emerge out of that are, again, best practices are local leaders moving things forward. So, for example, both pre and post COVID or post the initial response in Hayes County, Texas, the expanded use of citations in lieu of arrest, the same thing in Wilson County, North Carolina, um, the expansion of co-responder models in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, you know, really a, a broad range, and it depends on local discretion, as so many of these things do, and also depends on what sort of leadership or guidance is issued statewide. I just want to uh, chime in briefly to echo the leadership point, because I think um, my research focuses in part on the, the legal authority that sheriffs and other officials have. And, um, you know, there are some states where sheriffs have uh, site and release authority at booking where they can basically override the decision of a, a police officer as sheriff Higgins was saying many of these jails receive people not not only arrested by their own deputies but but by other police departments and um that authority can be very powerful um but whether somebody is willing to use it whether somebody's willing to have a conversation with a colleague in law enforcement and say look this this isn't going to work this isn't safe for our community um to to limit to limit that intake uh to jail is really important so so um often the the legal power exists although it varies significantly um and and exists on the back end in terms of release but but whether somebody feels comfortable using it and whether they um sort of built a consensus uh as sheriff higgins was describing is is really critical and real quick i think Professor Lippman, you made, I mean, made a really good point on this about some of the conversations that were had. You know, rural criminal justice systems have some very good benefits. We do have our challenges, to be sure, uh, but we have some good benefits. Usually, some of these things can be handled with phone calls or face to face meetings with the other agency administration and say, look, you know what we're facing, you know what our, what our issues are, um, you know where, what danger exists. Um, we may need to consider <laughs> what, what's more important here. Um, and we were able to handle a lot locally uh, with those face-to-face -face conversations with administrators to say, look, there are some violations I'm not going to tell you. And I didn't, I didn't have to put out mandates that said you will not arrest or I will not accept. Um, but here are the things that I really wish we would cite and release for. Um, the statutes in Texas allow for some criminal offenses that would be normally arrestable uh, to be uh, issued a, a summons, a notice to appear. You file the case. Now, that doesn't mean that the case goes away or they will never face that charge. It just means you're not getting arrested today. Um, we will let it go through the process and the case goes where it goes. Um, and so there's a specific list of those. Um, but what we saw during um, COVID uh, it was, was definitely the expanded use of that. And what normally they would be arresting for DWLI, driving with a you know, with suspended or invalid license 
or for uh, low level uh, criminal mischief or something to that effect, some minor property damage. They were actually beginning to cite and release these folks and then file cases uh, and have them address those things later. Now, of course, the other side of that is now you have all these cases that, are get, that get filed and uh, with an already slowed down system of justice, you know, with court appearances and such, is, does that create a new problem? And I, I don't believe that we saw that on our side. Um, our, our prosecutor's office has handled those very, very well. But uh, at, at our local level, I think what's good about our, our uh, rural systems is that we are definitely able to go and sit down and have face-to-face -face conversations. Uh, by and large, there are some, obviously, we know um, that uh, may not be open to those. Um, but by and large, we can have those face-to-face -face conversations and overcome a few hurdles and overcome some problems uh, without having to put out mass mandate across our entire county. It's that point that I want to follow up on is that, you know, those conversations are easier to have in rural spaces, um, but we're also running up against systems that want to return to business as, as usual. As, a, you know, as we're post in the post pandemic era, even though COVID is still um, a concern, courts, prosecutors offices are returning to the usual business as usual um, or the normal business as usual as Sheriff Higgins said, you've got people who are coming in just for appearances instead of going back to uh, or remaining remote. Can we uh, kind of talk about that, you know, that issue or that concern and talk about why we should be actually focusing on retaining some of those pandemic era policies um, for the swifter administration of justice? Sure, I, I, know, I think Jasmine, you're gonna have something on this, I, I believe. Um, but really quickly, um, you know, I had I had these conversations with our with two of our judges yesterday uh, about the use of, uh, for example, the the Zoom hearings for uh, our in custody personnel not having to translate or I'm sorry transfer individuals from our custody over to the courts and back or transport these folks around, uh, but making the use out of that. And both of our judges, uh, we have one district court and one county court, one statutory county court uh, that handles all misdemeanors. Our district court handles all our felonies. Um, they have basically uh, expressed they want to continue to use that. It is, it is better for them. It is better for us. Um, and we can still continue to have these, these hearings without having to worry about uh, an in-person setting, uh, particularly as what we, if you watch any of the news the last you know, uh, week or so, we're seeing uh, COVID cases going back up again in some areas. And that's a concern is what, how are the courts going to respond to this? So we're going to continue to use that here at the local level so that it prevents uh, the quote unquote business as usual, going back to um, settings and we we strictly rely upon those in-person hearings. They're gonna continue to use the uh, the online uh, versions of that as well. And I'm, I'm hoping that that uh, other jurisdictions will will uh, will take that that same leap and just, and let's, let's not fall back to those typical settings. Let's continue to use what technology is available to us. Please go ahead, Chef Higgins. I would say one of the challenges that, that we run into uh, you know, uh, we have nine uh, district courts and, uh, you know, the traffic court is, uh, the judges sometimes feel like uh, they're the lost ones. If anybody's going to be released or cited out, it's going to be a, for a traffic offense and even those who, who fail to appear. And so you may have someone that probably runs into is that you have those few individuals who know that they'll always be cited out. And then they'll, so they'll never come to court. And so that case uh, stays on the docket for that, that judge. And so uh, that's one of the issues that we, we run in with, with the judge, uh, with, with one of the particular judges, traffic judges, is trying to uh, coordinate when he actually has court. And if a person's arrested that has several, um, it appears that we'll hold those individuals so they can appear in court the next day. But, um, you know, you talk about the power. Um, it, it's getting the, the, the judges to understand, you know, because uh, we don't have the authority to release people that we think uh, we should release. Uh, it's up to those judges. Once they're in a certain court, once they go in, they, in their courts, it's filed to them. Uh, they're making those decisions and and we try to uh, talk to them on a regular basis but it's changing uh, their mindset 
And, and I think really when, when you look at nationally, one of the things that's impacting this, I think, is nationally we're seeing a uh, an increase in, in in violent crime. And and so you're going to have this big push to be tough on crime. And and there's people that need to be locked up, need to be that, that shouldn't be released. And I think if you go through the proper uh, bonding process or, or review, that you can identify those individuals. But but because of the the uh, the mindset of we've got to make our community safer, that net catches people who, if you evaluate their circumstances, they're not going to be a, a continued threat to the community. Um, but they get caught in that, and so you get the pushback. Uh, from the from the judges of not wanting to release and then wanting people uh, what we've experienced is uh, you know we would rather uh, do the video uh, appearance but we have judges that say I want to see that person I want them to stand in front of me and so uh, like sheriff said we're being forced in some cases to transport someone uh, taking that risk uh, for a five minute appearance before a judge. So I think one of the challenges is, is to uh, get the judges on board to um, to understand the, the needs and the benefits of the systems that we had in place during the pandemic and to continue to use those. I think, you know, that's precisely a point I was going to touch on. We need to sort of recognize that this shift to business as usual is not only happening as I think there is a sort of national desire to go back to our old lives and feel like we have more freedom, but amidst a national conversation about crime. And it is true that homicides have increased and they've been concentrated in major cities, but it's really across the urban to rural spectrum that we've seen an increase in homicides. We are also continuing to see in many places a rise in overdose deaths and in new forms of drug use. I think the thing that is really important is we owe it to survivors of crime. We owe it to people who struggle with substance abuse and their families to be really rigorous about data and evidence. And too often what happens is fear and sadness and frustration drives policy decisions and drives criminal justice decisions, including, again, outside the jail doors. So, you know, for example, the things that we know, is the communities with holistic pretrial services that focus on things like supporting people in appearing um, and remaining arrest free have lower rates of rearrest for violent crime. We know that remaining in jail, even for a few days, can make people more likely to be entangled with the justice system in the future. So there are all of these potential unintended consequences that come from returning to business as usual, even if people really are doing it from a sense of wanting to keep communities safe. I think the other piece that's really important to underscore, since often you will hear judges, probation officers, law enforcement members say, I am trying to keep someone alive, I'm afraid they're going to overdose on the streets that not only is jail often not the best or safest place to, you know, detox from drug use, to try to access medication assisted treatment, we also know that people are significantly more vulnerable to death after they've been released from jail, um, particularly where, again, there is not that continuity of care from the jail to more holistic community based supports. And so people will very frequently die of overdose after they, you know, have been in jail and then go back and use again and the consequences are deadly. So I think, you know, too often it's presented as sort of this binary between public safety and reform. And I think all of us see and um, have to keep repeating that public safety should be a hallmark of effective reforms and that we can do that. It's possible. Um, Aaron, I know you have you have additional points to raise, so I'm going to pass to you. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to make a, a point about the data on public safety and um, really along the lines of what Jasmine said about um, trying to be rigorous about what's causing um, what what we're seeing. And, and it's it's certainly a complicated question to understand what's causing the increase in homicides. Um, but uh, from my review of, of the research, it seems pretty clear that releasing um, people with low level charges in the pandemic is not what's causing it, right? That, that um, 
there's a really terrific study that I recommend folks take a look at if you if you have it from the NYU Public Safety Lab. And they looked at um, about 20 million individual level daily jail records between January and the end of October 2020. And they studied rebooking rates. So trying to see whether people are, are rearrested and rebooked over a period from 30 to 180 days. And that's a pretty good indicator, probably the best we have of whether releasing more people on low level charges caused any increase in future crime commission. And they found that it didn't, that actually rebooking rates remain somewhat lower than they were before the pandemic started, despite this um, massive uh, reduction in population uh, that, that Jasmine described. Um, and so obviously, you know, there's no, there's no question that um, figuring out how to address the rise in homicides is, is a very serious public safety concern. But um, I think important important to, to um, not misattribute that to some really um, important and significant changes um, that, as Sheriff Cyphers was saying, we you know uh, jails moved forward with and and some have um, persisted with during the pandemic. The other thing I I just want to say back on the the, the point of um, you know which actors in in the system have have power here. Um, you know, it's obviously the case that, um, you know, sheriffs, sheriffs can't do this alone. They can't reduce their jail populations alone. Um, I do want to say that, uh, you know, I think it's interesting to look at what state law says, what state legislators say about what the role of sheriffs should be in determining how many people are um, incarcerated and, and who's incarcerated. And in fact, in a number of jurisdictions, uh, state legislators have said they, sh they should have a lot to say about that. Um, so uh, Arkansas is a good example because uh, we have Sheriff Higgins here, but there's this remarkable provision in Arkansas state law that actually gives sheriffs the authority, it's the only state I've ever found where this is true, to release people from jail when they determine themselves that conditions in their jail have become unconstitutional. Um, now, obviously that's a, that's a pretty low floor as we all know. So, um, but that's really striking that that, you know, I think reflects the state legislators judgment that um, sheriffs actually do understand what's what's safe in their jail. Um, and, and when jails have become uh, so problematic that housing more people is, is not acceptable. Um, another example from Michigan, right, there's a there's a provision of state law that allows overcrowding release um, that exists in, in, in several other states as well. And sheriffs are actually tasked with assessing um, who should be released when and how. And, and so I think that, um, you know, state legislators understand that people in your positions do know a tremendous amount about how our, our criminal legal system functions and, um, and should have a lot to say about uh, why, we need to, why we need to have fewer people uh, locked up. So I'll, uh, yeah, stop there and hand it over. Um, for other, for other Thank you, Aaron. Um, I want to move the conversation to one more area before we get into our really lively Q&A, which is really great. Um, but before we get into those questions, uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk about is uh, something that's gone through or been a thread through all parts of these conversations is the, um, the collapse of public systems, um, staffing shortages and personnel, and then these ideas um, that you guys have, particularly um, Sheriff Cyphers and Sheriff Higgins have program have programs or um, ways of addressing some of these issues around mental health concerns or around recidivism um, that you know they're starting or that they're working on getting funding for. So for practitioners and other people, folks on the call, um, and I want to start with Jess because she still has a, a kind of general overview about funding for some of these programming or how to think about um, you know spreading. The, the responsibility for some of these programs so that it's not all in a sheriff's office or what can a sheriff's office, what kind of funding can they look for so that they can kind of spread the responsibility for building pretrial uh, service systems or um, kind of stepping into the gap for systems that are collapsing with budget issues from the state, things like that. Thanks so much. Um, this is something that I love to talk about because I think we are in a moment of unique hope and opportunity around just the scale of federal funding that has been unlocked and can be used really creatively, again, where there is leadership to do that, which is um, why having leaders like the two on this call are so critical. You know, we saw, for example, with 
the state and local recovery funds in the American Rescue Plan Act, there was this really expansive set of possibilities for how counties could build new co-responder models, could build different mental health responses, shift funding. Um, and we tried to document that. I can drop a link into the chat just how with regard to pretrial diversion, different mental and behavioral health responses and thinking about equity, there was tremendous latitude um, and particularly where there was leadership from sheriffs, from county commissioners, sometimes from prosecutors and public defenders offices. Counties were able to put things in place with that initial funding that generates long term cost savings that can then be redirected into different ways of approaching problems and thinking about safety. Um, the other one that just sort of popped up for me as I was deep in, in the text <laughs> was the recently passed gun legislation. So the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, really because of the focus on mental health that has brought the right and left together around addressing gun violence, you know, that again unlocked significant resources, both in the form of mental health block grants um, and other federal funding strategies for communities to say, all right, how do we build in pre-arrest or pre-booking responses to behavioral health expansively. Um, the last thing I'll say on the federal front, because it is, is brand new, it's just off the presses this morning, is uh, the Biden administration has just sort of unveiled what they're calling their Safer America plan, which includes a $15 billion grant program for um, mental and behavioral health and community-based responses. And, and that's in addition to almost 30 billion additional dollars for law enforcement, for community violence intervention, um, co-responder models. And so, you know, there is just a significant opportunity, I think, again, for local leaders to take these funds and to run with them and to show that star communities can really be, I think, some of the most fruitful innovators and really the places that show that if you can do something in rural Texas and rural Arkansas in a tribal community, um, you can do it almost anywhere, I think. Like as far as uh, from a, a program standpoint and kind of something that we had discussed uh, prior, you know, one of the, uh, the areas that we wanted to expand on here, even pre-COVID is something we had worked on is through a, a, that co-responder model. Uh, and typically something you would see in a larger area uh, and our, we're in a, in, in a Lubbock, Kind of metro area, Lubbock County is the largest in our in our area, and they're they're I uh, border them uh, on their west side, and we are serviced in Texas anyway. We're serviced by uh, local mental health authorities, uh, and there are 39 of those that were created statewide, and uh, Starcare particularly is one that's ours, and they service a five county area in our region, and they had been uh, kind of going along with kind of the Abilene or, uh, model or the Albuquerque model of a co-responder program by putting a clinician in a car with a uh, trained law enforcement officer uh, who may respond to a critical incident, some crisis situation uh, where the, the officer can make the situation safe, but we also have a clinician who can come in and help uh, do on-site assessments and help with diversion uh, away from the detention center. So it's somebody who may be uh, in, a, in, a, in a situation where they're off of medications or they're self-medicating, something substance induced, uh, but we can get them diverted to where they belong uh, as opposed to coming behind the bars um, and trying to, to uh, have an early intervention of sorts uh, because there is a proactive side to this model that we are, are uh, instituting. And this came about through um, funding sources that was uh, obtained by StarCare, by our LMHA, um, who put this program into place with us and it pays for the co-responder. And then of course, as Jasmine mentioned, the, the source of federal funds that are out there and creatively using this uh, to address these issues, our local uh, governing authority, our commissioner's court um, had actually put this um, funding into play and funded a mental health deputy specifically for this program. So um, this entire program right now is grant funded um, as kind of the, the test phase, um, but we have seen initially anyway, successful uh, implementation. We are seeing that over half the people we are contacting in these situations, we are able to divert them somewhere else. Uh, if they are, if this is truly a medical situation, they are put into medical care. They are they were moved uh, to that resource. If this is something that's a a mental health issue where somebody may be suicidal, thinking of hurting themselves, we have diverted them over to um, to the mental health authority for further evaluation. 
Um, so, so far, the folks that we are seeing on the, the response side, we are diverting um, with, but it all comes down to resources. It comes down to what do you have access to? And fortunately, our LMHA has got access to good resources. We are rural, but close enough to a metro that we have access to some of that. Um, but so far, anyway, it's it's been very productive. On the other side of that, on, on the proactive side, we actually have that grant fund paid for um, like an aftercare specialist is what they call it. This is someone who, after we contact these folks, is going to follow up with them, make sure that they they know about their doctor appointments, they know where to get their medications from, they can help arrange transportation to those who need it uh, if they if that is an issue because that is a problem with some folks where they cannot uh, they don't have a ride, don't have access to a vehicle to get to where they need to go. So um, these folks will help um, on the again on the proactive side, make sure that these contacts are, are uh, in place and that they remain so that again we can keep them from coming into our facility. Uh, at the here at Plastic County, uh, one thing we do have, we have a crisis intervention center for uh, people with mental health issues that law enforcement may come in contact with. Um, it's, it's positioned uh, next to our detention facility. Um, there are some restrictions on who you can bring into the facility. A uh, um, person brought there can walk away. So you volunteer to go in, and uh, but if you cho choose not to stay, you can leave. Uh, what we ran into uh, some issues with if the person had additional charges, uh, they would have to be processed in our facility. Uh, initially, it wouldn't allow them to be released from our facility and go into the uh, crisis intervention center. But we've worked at worked it out where they allow them if if a court will release them or we cite them out on the charge, they can go into that facility. Uh, it's not utilized as much as we would like for it to be utilized. Uh, we are uh, trying to move forward. We're working with the state uh, on a, putting a peer specialist, again, not necessarily dealing with, with mental health, but dealing with the uh, addiction, putting a peer specialist together with a deputy to respond to, to those calls. Uh, we're definitely interested in having a, a mental health uh, service, what uh, Sheriff was talking about, a program like that, uh, but trying to get the funding is, is an issue. Um, we did pursue the Recovery Care Act money. Uh, we did uh, approach our local uh, quorum court for funding to expand our mental health services in the facility. Um, unfortunately, it was rejected uh, by the uh, quorum court. Uh, didn't want to invest that money into uh, uh, that program. So we were disappointed in that. But um, we are working with the uh, UAMS, the University of Arkansas Medical Science, uh, working with some uh, researchers there to um, uh, develop a program. They have a grant and uh, to look at mental health in the facility uh, to help um, uh, identify those with mental health issues uh, beyond those that are there beyond the intake date and uh, connect them with, with resources. Um, we also, uh, we did receive a federal grant uh, for uh, substance abuse. And uh, it's, it was a $200,000 grant. Uh, it runs out in the next month, uh, but we were able to hire three staff members to uh, be in the facility to help with uh, people with addiction issues and to provide some uh, uh, housing for those who were left to go into a treatment program uh, to provide uh, 30 days, up to 60 days housing there. Uh, we, we have a, a uh, re-entry program in the facility that we started in 2019 and uh, it focuses uh, primarily on uh, people with uh, drug addiction issues. Uh, we actually house them in, in a unit together uh, to create a, create a culture and it's a program where it's 12 weeks of, of classes. Uh, we call it the CSI Academy where they're actually taking classes and dealing with uh, uh, substance abuse, um, other issues that, that they may have had, um, trauma, uh, other things like that. Um, so we have that program going right now. Uh, the plan is a, it's a three-phase program. One is the, the academy working on, on the, uh, their issues and, and, and uh, identifying uh, some trauma they may have dealt with. And then the uh, second phase of it, we partner with the local uh, college here, uh, Tech College, 
to provide some uh, job skill training and, and work readiness training. Uh, that's going to be launched next month. Uh, our goal is a third phase of it, uh, where we actually allow people, to, if they're going to be in our facility, try to get them to, to work uh, if they're uh, still having to be in, be in this facility. Uh, funding sources, you know, we've, we've uh, I mean, the Quorum Court has approved new positions for me. Um, this Quorum Court provides the funding for our positions. Um, and so we have some new positions dealing with our reentry program, two positions there. We pursued the grant. Also, we established a, a nonprofit, the Plessis County Sheriff's Prevention and Reentry Foundation. We had some uh, people in the community that cared about our youth and, and our reentry uh, people in the facility coming out and being successful. And so we did establish a, a nonprofit to, to raise money from the community. And so we utilized uh, those resources to help pay uh, for our, our reentry program in the, in the facility plan for. Uh, books and graduations and, and things like that. So we're trying to utilize uh, three sources still looking at. Uh, we've applied for a federal grant to the, the grant that paid for our um, our drug addiction program. Um, they came out with a new uh, grant that's more comprehensive, uh, would pay for the entire program we're doing. Uh, the regular grant, uh, most grants you can reapply for it, uh, but uh, this particular grant changed where they wouldn't they wouldn't continue to fund the same type of program had to be expanded. So we are pursuing uh, that to pay for the entire reentry program. And fingers across, you know, we're hoping to hear something uh, in the next month to see if we receive it. It's about a two million dollar grant. Thank you all. Um, so we're going to end with some insights into the programs, but I want to. Uh, kind of address some of the, the questions that we're seeing in the Q&A before we end our call. I'm going to kind of combine a couple of questions. So there's this uh, concern about uh, using remote technology in courts um, and when it's being used, is it being used exclusively for pretrial pre appearances or um, bond appearances? Or are we talking about um, using that technology throughout the uh, court, throughout court appearances, including the trials themselves, and um, how we're doing that, or should we be talking about that when we're, when we're especially talking about star communities, where remote, um, where access to the technology and access to reliable internet and access to those types of things may be uh, limited because of the area or because um, of, you know, reliable phone service internet aren't affordable or accessible for the people who are in those systems. Are there concerns about that or anybody want to touch on those? I can, let me, let me real quick. I'll address uh, both of those. We're not using, for locally anyway, we're not using um, the uh, online or the Zoom for their initial uh, magistration or when they, when they see the judge for the first time post arrest. Uh, we still have judges that come to our jail seven days a week. Uh, we have a rotation. So um, you will see a judge face to face within 24 hours of arrest, typically speaking, um, so that any kind of bond decisions can be made. And I think there was a question in here about the use of um, uh, the online um, technology to set bonds, and that may be higher in some areas. I think I saw that in one of the questions. Um, I can't speak to that part because we don't really use it that way. We have used it for um, uh, dockets. Where they're going to get a status on on a case? Are we ready for um, uh, trial? What are, where are we at on this case? Are we negotiating? Um, we've also had it for plea bargains, uh, where the attorneys will make arrangements to meet with their clients here at the jail, um, or we'll have their a teleconference of some sort where they go over the paperwork, and then we can do plea bargains um, through the remote um, technology. The second part of that, I think, is with the um, access to reliable internet and high speed internet. Um, I know in Texas, I can, and I can tell you uh, that the governor's office had established and legislature had established uh, a broadband development uh, office. And, I, and I'm on that, the, the governor's um, broadband, broadband development council. And we're looking exactly at that. What barriers are there to um, reliable and high speed internet for roughly a million Texans, you know, um, across the state in these rural and, and, and uh, uh, areas such as ours? And how do we address those? Uh, what are the barriers and how do we overcome those? So, and actually I'm going on, uh, they're having a meeting uh, next week. We're going to Austin to discuss this very thing. 
uh, but there are going to be funding opportunities that are out there for some some areas and things to look into. So um, I know that some states, not just Texas, but there's a national push for this as well. Uh, and then Texas has also got to push uh, for making sure we can connect everybody across the board, whether it's public safety, education, healthcare, or in-home um, access to uh, reliable internet. I just, I, it makes me laugh because I'm thinking about how many people who live, work, or have lived or worked in a rural community have like walked around holding their cell phone in the air trying to get cell phone service. That's a hallmark experience <laughs> of being in a star community, I think, for many people. Um, you know, I, the, the concern about virtual hearings, Zoom hearings, and I think particularly at first appearance is a very real one. Prior to the pandemic, one of the things that we saw with bookings into jail is that there were some jurisdictions where first appearances were remote, they were via video, and it is very difficult to have a constitutionally adequate pretrial hearing um, where someone has the right to present evidence and challenge the evidence against them, where they can, for example, speak to factors that may be in a risk assessment tool where there's a meaningful inquiry into ability to pay when their lawyer is someone else, somewhere else, they're in a jail cell, the judge is somewhere else. I think another thing that, that shows up a lot, even in trying to understanding jail bookings, um, is the problem of people not really fully understanding the conditions of their pretrial release because it's told to them over a bad video connection, they then violate, they end up back in jail. And so I do think this is sort of an innovation that we have to be very cautious about, very careful, and also recognize that a lot of the technology that relies on cell phone access, that relies on internet, um, isn't always going to work in rural communities. And you need to be innovative about different ways of contacting people and, and even having reliable mail and forms that are very clear so that people understand where they're meant to be next if they are released before trial. I'll, I'll just um, chime in to note that I think those challenges, um, you know, fall unevenly. And so while it's certainly true for, for everyone in a rural community that, I mean, frankly, I live in Los Angeles and I have trouble getting cell phone reception sometimes, but, um, you know, people who are so poor that they're unable to pay their cell phone bill every month, um, I think it's particularly acute uh, problem for people who have serious mental illness. I think communicating with a court and um, a lawyer over video is is particularly challenging for somebody who, who may be suffering from mental illness. Um, also for non-native English speakers, right? I mean, not using an interpreter over that connection is particularly challenging. So um, obviously there are some some significant advantages to it. If, if you're in the height of a pandemic and uh, breathing each other's air is infectious, then, then then of course there's 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 a real benefit. But um, I think we need to take account of those those distributional consequences as well when we think about how to implement it well um, where it's implemented. I just want to comment. Uh, I agree with the challenges. Uh, we do not we do the the video uh, first appearance uh, here. Uh, we'll have uh, attorneys uh, that will be in the facility uh, to meet with the clients prior to uh, going online with the with the judge. Uh, for trials, uh, all the trials are are in person, uh, and do recognize that it is a it is a challenge if you're expecting uh, all agencies to to use this technology. And you know, then when you look at um, um, you know, ways of people being released on, uh, there's some talk about uh, cell phone technology or watch technology, release them and still hold them in jail, um, but being able to track their information by the by the watch or the cell phone that you run into that same thing of, uh, are they gonna get a service and will they have a violation because they didn't receive the information about a court hearing or something like that. So it is, it is an issue, uh, but it's an issue that can, all it takes is money to solve, you know, to invest in the technology uh, that we need. And, and I think it's, convincing, uh, looking at our resources and, and identifying how we can best utilize it. And having the people with the knowledge uh, and experience to be able to say, this is a way to invest um, the, the, the resources so that we can have a fair uh, system uh, that, that's balanced. But it's probably gonna end up always having to be 
um, both uh, utilizing the, the, the technology so you can uh, save on time, save on uh, uh, resources to do that in appearance uh, by video, but also having those those cases where it needs to be uh, in person. Uh, so we have to uh, have the resources and the people around the room to to identify to make sure we don't overlook uh, issues that, and only focus on on one benefit that outweighs uh, another or, or causes a harm to to the individuals that that need to have that they're looking for a fair treatment in court. Um, we're like at time, but I do want to have time for a parting thought. Um, I'm going to ask uh, a question for all the panelists and then ask for a parting thought from all of you. But um, as part of your parting thoughts, could each of you kind of touch on maybe strategies for bringing in um, other systems actors into these conversations so that you can either keep these uh, wills of, of efficient justice turning, um, uh, for people in places where they aren't having the kind of ease of, of access to other systems actors like prosecutors offices and judges and uh, or where they're bumping up against election concerns or public uh, perception concerns about addressing this as a systems approach and kind of your uh, closing thoughts on, uh, well, I guess not closing thoughts, but maybe even closing thoughts and questions on um, what you want to see or what types how this conversation can evolve moving forward. We can start with Aaron. Sorry. Okay, well, um, I will uh, just give a plug for the importance of data in all of this. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's natural for somebody who's running one of these, um, one of these very challenging institutions to say, um, I don't really want to broadcast the, the challenges that we have in the form of a dashboard, but I think that um, it is vital for, um, uh, you know, productive evidence-based conversation between uh, public officials and with stakeholders in the community um, that, that more and more data be shared. And that's actually something we, we saw a lot of from prisons um, during the pandemic around uh, COVID cases, around deaths, um, some from jails, although much less. And um, I think that's partially due to lack of data infrastructure, uh, you know, lack of resources to, to, to set it up and uh, publish it. But um, I think, you know, being able to assess how these reforms are working, um, what's happening uh, in real time and, um, you know, uh, Jasmine's project does incredible work with data, and um, I think the more it can be published, and the more that people can can take a look at it and have a have a real debate about um, how to respond to these serious challenges, the better. So that's where I'll stop. I think um, thank you for that, Erin. Uh, mostly brilliant data scientists and researchers on my team make that a reality. I will say, I think what we have seen for the power of transparent jail data, supervision data, court data, systems data, is it becomes an anchor from which both civil society and system actors, whether they are elected or appointed, can have a conversation around shared values and the way that those values should inform local justice systems. Um, and again, to really harp on this theme of leadership, where there has been leadership within local government who, who sees this as really a hallmark of good governance, of small, transparent, and effective government, I think that has helped bring people together and move conversations forward, really believing that civil society also has a seat at the table. Um, you know, you, you sort of asked also about how else you bring people together, and there was a, a question about the fiscal element of all of this that came up in the chat. So I wanted to say, I think, you know, for some people who don't necessarily come to the conversation deeply steeped in the research or experiences of law enforcement, corrections, courts, um, there are other actors who come to the table often because of the fiscal implications of these systems. We did analysis in a couple of states uh, around the potential cost savings had jail populations stayed low. And we found that in Kentucky, for example, if every jail in the state had maintained its sort of decline, its, its um, trough, its deepest trough in jail population, 
the total statewide savings would have been more than $30 million. So we're talking um, sometimes for very small counties about significant amounts of money. And I've had many policymakers say to me, you know, I, I came to this issue because of the fiscal implications and I stayed because of the human cost that I see. Um, so I think that really holding both of those pieces are so important as we move forward with transforming all of our systems. I'll jump in. I think, you know, at the at our level, engaging these folks in these conversations, I think you're realizing at the county level, you're dealing with um, everybody's elected. Uh, we have very independent offices. Uh, everybody is elected to hold that office. And uh, we all know I mean, sometimes it can get a little contentious. Um, but I think that we look at this from a data perspective. Uh, look at what, what are the numbers telling us? Where What are the trends telling us? It is not a personal affront. We are not attacking an office, but we want to identify the problem and how do we fix it? And that now all of us are going to be involved in this. If you look at a true systems approach and kind of how we started looking at this locally is while we are independent, we are interdependent. Um, there are some things that certain offices will do that will affect us and impact us. So I think the focus for us was less on the individual holding the office and more about the efficiencies or the inefficiencies that each one of us may identify within our own operations and come to the table and say, okay, how does this put to the problem? How does this um, um, help solve the problem? And then what do we wanna really focus on going forward? So it's less about the individual and more about here's what the system is, here is the problem, let's get in there and, and tackle it. It really was as simple as getting a lot of smart people in a room, locking the door, and we're not coming out until we have at least one good suggestion to, to implement today. And as a sheriff, you have a place that you can lock the door. So, sorry. Um, I, I wanna say that I think that the data is extremely important but we have to have a, a, a two-part approach to this. I've got to touch your mind with the data that shows that you're right. But I also have to touch your heart. i got to make you care about it. Because if you don't care, if it doesn't affect you, it doesn't matter what the data says. It's not worth my money, my taxpayer's money, or, or whatever investment we're putting into this. I, I think we have to uh, recognize that there are, the, the criminal justice system has impacted uh, more people than than, than uh, some people want to uh, admit to. Uh, drug addiction, mental health impacts people. You know, we will, we want to keep things in the closet. I may not tell you about my personal experience, but if you can touch me and make me relate to that, that I I have a family member, I know someone who has suffered from addiction, and I know it's destroyed their lives, or it's destroyed my life ten years ago. You just don't know it because you didn't see me 10 years ago or the, the mental health issues. So I think we have to, uh, first, I think we have to bring some people to the table that can tell a story. When, when you have someone that can stand up and, and they, they don't look like they've had some struggles. They, they don't look like they've been to prison. Uh, but they stand in front of you and, and, and maybe they look like the, the, some of the people in the, audience, some of the people who are making the decisions, and, and they begin to talk about the issue and then share that they were one of the ones in jail. They were the one of the ones struggling with, with mental health issues or struggling with, with addiction. Uh, and, and the example I'm, I'm going to give, and I don't want to offend anybody, but when we look at addiction, when you, when you look at uh, uh, crack, crack was so bad. If people who were addicted to crack were stealing from their family members, and the solution was to lock them up, when, when it, it primarily affected inner city African American people, when when meth came along, and it's always been there, but when it became an issue, it was so dangerous. You know, people were stealing from their family, and 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 in our it became an issue that, that we need to do something. We're going to lock them up, but we're going to provide some, uh, also some services community corrections are providing classes for them. The opiate ec epidemic comes out. And oh my God, it's infecting everyone. It, it, the, the, the doctor, the, 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 the family member, the, the mom. And the solution 
has become let's invest resources into it and let's sue pharmaceutical companies. Now, we were able to get money to deal with uh, addiction in our facility. The grant initially said for addiction to opiates or could be addicted to opiates. If you're suffering from addiction, addiction is addiction, whether it's alcohol, whether it's crack, whether it's meth, whatever it is, people are using a variety of drugs and we have to address that. And so we have to take advantage. And only, I believe people who recognize, people within the authority, people who made decisions about funding, recognize they saw themselves, they saw someone they cared about when they looked at opiates. They said it could happen to me. It became personal. The data told you you need to do something but it was personal. And I think we have to make it personal. I think we bring people to the table who have experienced this, whether they've been incarcerated or not, but dealing with addiction or mental health, they need to be part of the conversation. And, 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 and their family needs to be part of the conversation. And they can bring the heart into the data. Because if I touch your mind and know the data is, is true, and I touch your heart, I make you care. Now you're willing to listen and maybe invest and speak up because if the community, like the sheriff said, we're all elected. Well, if the community who's voting say it's important, then we need to listen. Thank you, Sheriff Higgins. That's a really great way to end this conversation. Um, in our pre-conversations and even now, we feel like we could probably keep talking. We could hold another hour of conversation. We still have plenty of questions that we talked about and plenty of questions from the audience, but we wanna be respectful of time. And um, thank you all who stayed over to listen to the final thoughts of our panelists. Um, if you have any questions uh, for our panelists, please be sure to email us at decentjusticecenter at smu.edu and we'll forward the questions along and let them answer at their uh, convenience. And if you have any questions about how we use this, this Star Justice platform for um, convening stakeholders and practitioners and providing platforms for information, providing resources, please also email us at decentjusticecenter at smu.edu. We plan to keep having these conversations. We think of these as the start of conversation or the impetus of the conversations, and we keep having them um, in different iterations across the themes in our STAR Justice series. So thank you so much for your time and for joining us, and please join us again in October for our next STAR event. Yes, I think it's in October, but watch our uh, our calendar space on our Decent uh, Center website at decentcenter.snu.edu. Watch our event calendar and watch that space for upcoming events in our Star Justice Series and our CJR, our Criminal Justice Reform Scholarship Workshops, and in our um, and in our decent specific programming. So thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you so much to our audience, and we'll see you all next time. Have a great afternoon.